just by way of stage setting, uh, we at Kendall, those of us that live here on the campus, are blessed and grateful for the wonderful setting we live in and the beautiful views that we enjoy. And visitors often comment on entering the campus, the fantastic views to the east of the Blue Ridge Mountains, tens of miles north and south. And so we see that uh, view shed in all kinds of seasons, and we've all collectively witnessed a new condition in that view shed, wildfire. So we saw the smoke plumes, and we experienced two days worth of smoke uh, here at Kendall. So I think this is a kind of a, a practical interest to all of us to hear from the uh, experts on the topic about that fire. Uh, I'm going to introduce Lauren. She's got uh, two <coughs> colleagues with her that she may weave in to the program. Uh, Lauren is the district ranger for the Glenwood Peddler Forest Service District in the George Washington Jefferson National Forest. Uh, she has responsibility for 250,000 acres of national forest. Uh, this is Lauren by the numbers, I think. Five wilderness areas, one national scenic area, 100 miles plus of Appalachian Trail. I might add many, many more miles of other maintained trails. We call them Blue, Blue Blaze Trails. 100 miles or so of the Blue Ridge Parkway through the forest and several campgrounds and recreational areas. I happen to be on one this morning, Cape Mountain Lake, a wonderful place if you've not visited there. And Lauren works with her team of 30 Forest Service professionals to uh, exercise stewardship uh, over uh, the National Forest territory. Uh, Lauren herself, uh, by my count, has three degrees from Virginia Tech undergraduate and two advanced degrees, all in the forestry area. Uh, she's been in her position as district ranger here for about eight years, but prior to that she was a district ranger in North Carolina for three years and served with the Forest Service both in California uh, and Florida. Um, last but not least for these purposes, Lauren is also a mom, and she and her husband have three children, uh, and I understand that they really enjoy the outdoors. <laughs> uh, finally, uh, in Lauren's official biography, she states that she loves her job, and one thing that she loves about it is there's no such thing as a normal day. <laughs> so, please welcome Lauren Stone. they are too loud to keep indoors together. Um, I'm going to start by introducing Danny Wright. Danny is how many years on the district now? Since 2007. Okay. <laughs> Danny is our district wildlife biologist. He um, interestingly started his career in fire, so he has a really unique background and is a wealth of knowledge and will be here um, to answer questions afterwards. And then Joe Darrells has been an employee. He started about two weeks, maybe not even quite two weeks before the fire started. Um, luckily, uh, Joe is our assistant fire management officer for the, the fire zone that we cover. Luckily, Joe um, was familiar with this area. He had previously worked for the Forest Service and comes to us from uh, Shenandoah National Park in a fire position there. So he got here just in time for all the fun. They're going to jump in um, here and there, and again, we'll be here to answer all the hard questions. Okay, so I am going to force you to sit through just a couple of slides that are not specific to the Matt's Creek Fire so that you know um, who we are and what we do in addition to wildfire suppression. So if you are not familiar, the um, National Forest land in Virginia is known as the George Washington and the Jefferson National Forest. We used to be two different forests. And now we have been administratively combined into one. Our headquarters is down in Roanoke. And then the forest, for management purposes, is broken up into what we call ranger districts. And so I have the great pleasure of being the district ranger for the Glenwood and the Peddler Ranger District. That's the same territory that Danny covers. And then Joe gets the pleasure of covering the Glenwood and Peddler Ranger District 
and the James River and Warm Springs Ranger District. So we spend a lot of time here, um, kind of all around Rockbridge County. Okay, so our ranger district, we have about a quarter of a million acres. We have land in six counties. Um, Rockbridge County, interestingly, there's land on the, the adjacent ranger district and this ranger district that's split up a little bit. Um, Bruce mentioned we have about 30 permanent employees. We have our office down in Natural Bridge Station, but we are not at the state park. We are a separate entity. We're federal, they're state, we love them. We work with them all the time, but we are two different entities. Um, importantly, we get a lot of work done through volunteers. Some of those people are in the room now, um, and if you look really, really closely, you'll see Bruce is doing some volunteer work from several years ago um, in that photo there. Most of our trail maintenance, importantly, is done by volunteers, and we could not do it without them. Um, there's also one Forest Service retiree hiding in the middle of the room there, so David Zinovich, welcome, and he'll correct anything I mess up. Um, and then we have, in addition to a lot of trail miles and other things, we manage about 250 miles of roads that are open to the public as well. Um, what do we do? In addition to fire, which we're going to talk a lot about today, um, we do habitat improvement projects. We do a lot of that habitat improvement work via forest management, timber sales, timber stand improvement. Um, we have a large engineering program, a whole lot of roads, we have a lot of buildings, water lines, um, septic systems, lots of things, especially in our recreation areas that we're responsible for maintaining. The Forest Service is unique in that lots of things are allowed to happen on our land. The Park Service has kind of one mission, the Forest Service has a multiple use mission. And so we have driveways, we have power lines, we have lots of things that cross our national forest lands. And so we call those special uses and we work on a lot of those projects. Um, we've got a full range of what I call ologists, botanists, geologists, um, hydrologists, and they help us make sure we're doing a great job of taking care of all those resources. And then last but not least is recreation. Bruce hit on a lot of these, but on the piece of ground that we manage, we have a lot of campgrounds. If you've been down to Cave Mountain Lake, if you haven't been, go to Cave Mountain Lake, beautiful, quiet spot. Um, the not quiet spot is Chirando Lake, another beautiful spot that's pretty busy. You all mainly have the opportunity to go during the week, and I'd encourage that. A lot of trail miles, again, that we accomplish maintenance on with volunteers. We have an ATV trail system um, and a lot of wilderness areas, which we'll touch on. We are guided um, in our management of the National Forest with what we call our forest um, we call this our forest plan. We're required by Congress to have a forest plan. These are developed collaboratively with the public. Lots of um, public input. Laura and others in this room have been involved in, in helping shape these forest plans. Our district is unique in that we have two forest plans. Half of our land is on the Jefferson and half is on the George Washington. So these fine folks um, work through both forest plans, which are both several hundred pages thick. So. That guides our management, and then here, um, each forest plan has what I would describe as like a zoning map. The forest plan divides the forest into sections and tells us what we can and can't do in certain sections of the forest. And so we're gonna talk specifically about James River Face, which is green on this map here, um, and that's because it's a congressionally designated wilderness area. So wilderness by federal law, the Wilderness Act, um, guides management just a little bit differently in these areas of the forest. So motor vehicles, motorized equipment, mechanical transport, um, building roads, all those sorts of things are prohibited in wilderness areas. So if we have a tree that comes down across a trail and an employee or a volunteer goes out to take that tree out, in a wilderness area they would use a crosscut saw and not a chain. In emergencies, like wildfires, we can receive special permission from our forest supervisor to use those tools. And so we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, across the whole forest, we have about 140,000 acres of wilderness um, in 23 different areas. And again, we're gonna spend some time talking about the James River Face Wilderness. It is Virginia's oldest, oldest wilderness. It was designated in 1975. If you've been out there, you will notice um, 
it is very busy. The Appalachian Trail goes through there as well as several other trails and it is heavy recreation use. One of the most popular areas is the Devil's Marble Yard. So that just draws a lot of visitors to the school grounds area. And if you all have questions, I'm gonna jump to the next slide and start talking about fire. If you all have questions, you can ask them at the end, but if you have something that you'd really like to know while I'm talking, it's not gonna mess us up, just let us know. Okay, we're switching to wildfire, which is why you all came in addition to wine. Um, <laughs> Wildfire suppression is, I, I came up with this yesterday, I was thinking about how to describe it, and my kids are playing basketball right now, so it's, it's very much a team sport. Um, the Forest Service has responsibility for wildfire suppression on national forest lands, just like Shenandoah National Park would have a, um, management responsibility for wildfire suppression on their lands. The Virginia Department of Forestry, our state partners, they have responsibility on state lands and on private lands. So um, in an area like this, where all those lands are all commingled together, um, we have to work together. Wildfire doesn't stop at the private property boundary. Um, I think wildfires always like to happen on property boundaries and such, but we work really cooperatively with all of our partners. Um, in addition to the State Department of Forestry, we know lots of people who are doing this on, um, on their time as volunteers. So that's a picture from the Glasgow Volunteer Fire Department down near us in Natural Bridge. Um, but we work with volunteer fire department members from across the, the county and across, I guess, nine counties in Joe's situation. Um, they're typically the first ones to get to a fire, so they're a really important part of wildfire suppression. Just didn't want to leave them out um, of, this, of this conversation. Um, a couple of statistics. I pulled the number of fires that, that our folks, just us, and this is not statewide, this is just kind of our, our fire management area. So if you look at um, 2023, we had a lot of acres. We had 11,000 acres plus this 101 over here um, because of the one big fire. If you look at last year, we had 20 fires for about 544 acres. Um, the statistics that are not included in this are all the times where we go assist the State Department of Forestry or the acres that are on private land. So, so some years are really quiet. Some years are really busy. Um, 2016 um, was the last really busy year. That year we had the Cellar Mountain Fire, which was really close to here. That was over 800 acres. And then we had the Mount Pleasant wildfire, which was actually larger than the Maps Creek wildfire. It didn't produce as much smoke, so many of you never even heard of it, but that was over in um, Amherst County and near the Mount Pleasant National Scenic Area. And then Danny was talking to me earlier in the office about 2012, that was before I arrived here, but 2012 was probably the craziest um, year over the last decade. That year we had what we called the Easter Complex. Many of those fires were right here in and around Rockbridge County. I'm sure Dave Benovich remembers them well. But that was six fires that were managed together and those ranged in size from just under 800 acres to over 15,000 acres in size. So some of you probably remember that. Okay, so we're gonna walk ourselves back to November of last year. Um, <coughs> All the conversations in November in our office were kind of related to the weather and how dry it was. Um, at the time of the Maps Creek wildfire, it had been 30 days since we had had significant rainfall. That means the Weather Service calls that more than a quarter of an inch. Um, so we hadn't had any rain. Um, we've had a lot of freeze thawing. So all of the fine fuels were now really readily available to burn. And then we had this beautiful week where we all spent a lot of time outside. The temperatures went back up. It felt like, felt like um, much more like early fall than late fall. And we were so dry that the forest actually implemented some fire restrictions. The Blue Ridge Parkway did the same thing. I believe Shenandoah National Park did. But we said, if you're on Forest Service land, you can't have a campfire like you normally would unless it's in a, like a, a fire ring at Cave Mountain Lake, for example. The last time we had done any fire restrictions on the forest was 2016. So we were all thinking it was dry, knowing what was going on, watching closely. 
We've even started bringing in some outside resources. So we had some um, large helicopters that were here on the forest because it was so dry. And we had some crews that were here from um, typically the Western United States to help us out. And we had some small fires. We were running fires kind of regularly. We're able to catch most of those. Um, on November 12th, we got a call um, from the county and they reported a fire in the middle of the James River Face Wilderness. Folks could see it. Um, it was right at dark um, and we didn't really know what we had out there, but we knew it was gonna be a bit of a problem just because we could tell it was in the middle of the wilderness. So what we did for all fires, we assigned an incident commander. And that's someone who comes in and they work for us and they are responsible for leading a team of people. And we'll talk more about that team in a couple of slides, but they're responsible for leading a team of people in suppressing the wildfire. Sometimes the incident commander and a handful of folks can do that. And sometimes it takes the incident commander and a really large team. So we'll kind of walk you through what that looks like. But we use the same um, strategy in terms of building this team for a fire that is um, less than one acre in size on the side of the road to a fire that's as large and complex as the Match Creek fire. So it's a very scalable um, system and it's a system that is actually used in other disasters such as hurricanes. So we'll talk more about that in the slide or two. Um, but we started looking around, we said, okay, what's going on out there? What are our values at risk? What do we wanna make sure we protect? So we knew we had the Appalachian Trail out there. We knew we had some Appalachian Trail infrastructure. There was an Appalachian Trail shelter where campers can stay overnight. There was an Appalachian Trail privy or toilet building out there. Um, but we knew there wasn't a whole lot of other infrastructure right there near the fire itself. Um, again, we talked about this is a wilderness area. So I got on the phone with my boss and some of the fire staff and we said, hey, with the conditions we're under, we need emergency approval to use chainsaws, leaf blowers, do water drops, things like that in the wilderness. And he very quickly said, yes, I agree, we need to do the same thing. So we got those approvals in place. And then um, we start scouting. We start looking at where the fire is. We start pulling out all our maps and we start saying, what are the different ways we can build a box around this fire? So we started, I mentioned our forest was ready. We had a lot of aviation assets here. And so our first approach was let's go drown this thing with a lot of water. It keeps our resources out of there. We don't have to put a lot of firefighters in the middle of the wilderness. So we said, let's try that. Let's use the Appalachian Trail as one of our potential containment lines. So we sent a few folks in and we put a lot of water on there. And this fire just didn't want to cooperate with us. It was very dry. Our folks made really good progress on using the Appalachian Trail as a containment line, but the fire kept growing overnight when we couldn't keep people in there and when we couldn't keep water on it. So it was just so dry, this fire could burn through the night, which is somewhat unusual for, for us here. I talked about those structures. Um, we were able to, um, protect them by basically removing all the fuel from around them and then bringing the fire really close but not too close to them. So these are some, these are some of the things that our firefighters were doing in the very early days was protecting this infrastructure and trying to, trying to build a box around this fire. I'm going to talk a lot about building the box. Um, those people who are familiar with the James River Faith Wilderness know it's, it's very steep and there's not a lot in there um, in terms of containment lines that you could use, especially when it's really dry and fire is really wanting to move through there. And so we started looking at what are our options. And so on one side of the fire, we have this great natural barrier, the James River. On another side of the fire, we have a man-made barrier that we frequently use for fires, the Blue Ridge Parkway. And then we were able to piece some other roads together. But we started looking at what is this box going to look like. And um, I would say within a few days, we realized this really big box is probably the box we're going to have to use with how dry it is and how much, how much fire activity we have. So we started working on building the box. We didn't have as many resources as we needed. We needed more firefighters. There were lots of fires all across the southeast. And so we needed more people and we were fighting to get them, but we couldn't get as many people as we needed. 
Um, and so we, we started building this box, but we knew we needed more help. And so at that point, what we do is we look at all the factors we're dealing with and we say, hey, this fire is more complex than we can handle here locally. We've got a great group of folks, but there's not enough of them and we can't handle all of the things that are coming along with this large fire and this large box that we're building. And so what we do is we order a complex incident management team. And so an incident management team, again, for a small fire, we assign an incident commander and some people to help. For a larger fire, we do the same thing. This is what almost every incident management team looks like, that org chart there. You have an operations section, and those are the people who are the fight, they're fighting the fire. They are the firefighters out there. They are managing all that aircraft and the safety of that aircraft that we have. They're, they're, they're the on the ground, folks that everybody really appreciates. There's a whole planning section that's helping us put together a plan and they're doing all the paperwork. They, um, they have people in the planning section like an incident meteorologist, for example, who could say, here is the exact weather, as good as a meteorologist can give you the weather, but here's the exact weather for this fire, here's what I think is gonna happen. We have fire behavior analysts who they just study fire behavior and what it does under certain conditions. And so all those folks are in the planning section. Logistics section, those people make everything happen and they're always underappreciated, but they make sure firefighters have water. They make sure um, that our trucks are fueled up and that if people have flown in from California, that they have a leaf blower, because here in the South we use leaf blowers to fight fires. So they do a little bit of everything for us. They secured an incident command post for us down at the old Maxwell Bridge High School. But that's what that whole section does. Then we have the finance section, which nobody loves because they are tracking all of our costs, but they're really important, especially for this fire. We had a lot of contractors. A lot of the Western firefighters were off and when we needed people, we were using contractors. And so that finance section was really helpful in making sure that we paid people the right amount and that we paid them on time. And then the people that um, are also really important, the public information officers. We had one woman um, doing public information and she was doing seven or eight media interviews a day and we were still falling behind and I felt like I was drowning this poor woman. Um, when the team came in, they immediately said, wow, we need six people. And I think they actually added to that. Um, if you followed our Facebook page, the team came in and started doing Facebook posts that were getting like 10,000 plus views in a day. So high demand for information and the team was able to bring that to us. And then we have a safety officer and liaison officers who again are just helping us communicate with the right people to make sure we're keeping our people safe. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna say on that one. We'll answer questions, but this is kind of your really quick and dirty version of what an incident management team does. Um, after 9-11, they brought in incident management teams and the Forest Service taught a lot of folks how to handle the scene in the aftermath of 9-11, for example. They used the same model. Um, the shuttle, um, the shuttle that was lost, shuttle disaster, I'm losing my words. Um, same thing, an incident management team was brought in. The system that works and, and we use it for small things and, and really big things. Oh, the other thing I wanted to add on incident management teams, these folks come from across the country. Some of them are Forest Service employees who are local. We have an engineer in our Roanoke office who was on this team. Some of them are state employees. Some of them are retirees. Um, it's just a good mix of people from all sorts of backgrounds and they, they put their name on a list and say, hey, I'm willing to, to leave at Thanksgiving and go help another community out. So great group of folks. Okay, when Bruce invited me to speak, he sent the picture of the smoke from, um, from Kendall. Um, this was something we had worked through a lot of wildfires in the past and the smoke from this fire was more impactful and there was just more of it than any um, fire that I've dealt with in my career. I think Danny was saying the same thing. Um, so we very quickly realized we were gonna have smoke impacts and we phoned a friend. My kids had their first smoke days, so they were really, I feel like my kids were really excited about the fire. But we phoned a friend. Um, we phoned what's known as an air resource advisor. 
And we actually called this morning in advance of that whole big team of people coming. But we said, we have a wildfire and it's creating significant smoke impacts to our community and we don't know what to do, help. And this woman who is local to Bedford but has never worked a wildfire in Virginia before, she came over to help us and she was fantastic. She typically works wildfires in the West Wildfires in the West typically happen in the summer, typically, so kids are already out of school. Um, anyway, but she came in, her first Virginia fire was the Match Creek fire working with us, and she got to work right away. That, some of you might know Randy Walters with the Rockbridge County School System. Randy is down there in the bottom corner helping, oh goodness, <laughs> helping set up an air quality, I'm not going to move, set up an air quality monitor with our air resource advisor. I believe that's right there at Waddell. She set up um, air quality monitoring stations at schools in kind of all the impacted communities. Um, she started getting on the phone every day with school districts and superintendents and saying, here's what the forecast is going to look like for your specific area. Here's Here's our recommendations. It's your decision on what you do, but here's what's going to happen. She um, was meeting with DDOT regularly and saying, hey, on this specific day, there's going to be impact 281. Sometimes <coughs> the impacts were just, it's going to be very visible, and you might get looky-loos creating accidents. And sometimes there were visibility concerns, particularly down near the river around 501. So she was fantastic. She came in. She did community outreach. And a lot of people in our community learned what airnow.gov, that website is. But you could pull that up on your phone right now, and you can, it, it geolocates you, and it basically spits out air quality readings from sensors in your local area. And so she was able to tie all her sensors in. Anyway, she's magnificent, but smoke, we couldn't do a lot about the smoke other than tell people what to expect and communicate the potential impacts of it. Um, I know that she met with several, um, she met with the emergency operation coordinators or the emergency management staff for all the counties. And sometimes they were saying, hey, we have a retirement community here or folks with breathing conditions here. And she was just able to advise them on what to expect. Okay, Danny is going to jump in here and help me. But Danny served as one of several reads or resource advisors on the fire. So whenever we have a wildfire, we can assign resource advisors to help us make sure that we're not damaging any resources while we're taking care of the fire. Um, those resources could be cultural, they could be heritage archeological sites, um, they could be <coughs> recreation sites. The Appalachian National Scenic Trail is in here and we wanted to do our best at, at taking care of that. Um, wilderness itself is a resource. We want to take care of that. Um, Danny, do you want to talk a little bit more about reads and their role? Could I ask a quick question? Yes, Are you please. going to address the, um, the concepts of suppression versus uh, containment? Uh, you, and, and how the box fits into that? Are you going to... I can go into that. Let me let Danny hit on reads, and then Joe and I will do our best to talk through that, that thought process. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Danny Wright. I'm the, the district wildlife biologist on the Glenwood Peddler. Uh, that's my day job, but when the fire bell rings, uh, that changes very quickly. One of the roles that I uh, typically fall into uh, during a fire, a wildfire event, especially a large uh, fire event, uh, is this resource advisor role. This is a role that's fairly new in the fire suppression world. Uh, I've been fighting fire since the mid 90s and resource advisors didn't always exist. So this, this is a really good step in fire suppression um, from our agency and, and nationally actually uh, to, to assign resource advisors to large complex uh, fire situations. So really what resource advisors do is provide a link between the team that Lauren mentioned that comes in from, from, from all different directions and they have so much to consider. They have safety of firefighters, safety of the public. You know, they have all the logistics. There's just so much going on, especially in the first couple shifts of firefighter suppression. <clears throat> it's easy for small things or resource uh, related items to fall through the cracks. So it would be my job to focus 
specifically on the resources that are at risk, not only from the fire, but potentially from our um, suppression efforts. And I'm the link between that team and the area administrator or the, or the decision maker, which is the district ranger, uh, Lauren. And so all these people that Lauren mentioned work for her in some form or fashion. Now they're all specialists in their own, in their own way, but they all answer to like the, her overall uh, desires and wishes um, moving forward. So I get to be that person. It's really rewarding. I get to be in the field um, looking at fire effects, uh, what's going on with the fire. I get to come back to the incident command post and weigh in with the team and, and help develop the plan. Um, and then at the end of the fire, it's my job to assess whether there's a rehabilitation needs, uh, either from the fire <coughs> or from our actions, our suppression actions, and then maybe even long-term monitoring, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Danny served as a resource advisor on a very small four or five acre fire over the weekend, um, right here. If you had been standing at Napa Ridge State Park, you could have looked up and seen it. State Park Manager sent us some photos. Um, one other product here, this map with all the lines all over it, when you see big air tankers drop out west, what color is the stuff coming out of the tankers? Have you all seen photos of that? What color is it? It's orange or red, and that's retardant. Um, here, we have retardant avoidance maps. So when they look at this map, they're like, oh my gosh, we can't drop anywhere because there's water everywhere here, right? So if you saw the, we used tankers one day on this fire, and if you noticed in that earlier photo, the only thing coming out of those tankers was, was water. So, and it's because of resource advisors making sure that they have that information. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this, and then if I don't get your question in this, we'll come back to it. Okay, so I called this slide turning the corner because things were starting to come together. We had most of the box constructed. The team was able to help us get the additional resources and firefighters that we need. We were finally starting to meet the public's demand for information. And we had an opportunity. We had a containment line way down here, and we had fire way up here on the mountain. And we saw some weather. We're like, hey, there's rain coming in a day or two or three. The other thing we were seeing is there's a front potentially coming with that rain and there might be some wind. And so we had an opportunity on one day to go in and with the use of um, helicopters, basically dropping little balls that ignite. You wanna talk about that, Joe's the expert. Anyway, we had an opportunity to go in and do a burnout and basically bring the fire all the way down to our containment lines on our terms. So it was, it was a big show. Um, at night, it looked even crazier than it looked during the day, um, but it allowed us to get that fire down to that line, which was real close to houses in many places, on our terms. And it didn't, you know, the fire didn't rage down the fire. We dropped fire on the ridges and it backed slowly down, which is exactly what we wanted. Um, so that, that really brought the fire to our box, and then we knew, hey, we're going to have rain that's going to stop all this smoldering that's creating a whole lot of smoke. So anyway, all that kind of came together real well. That rain gauge that you can't read had over three and a half inches of rain. So there was some, there was some good luck mixed in with this too. Um, and then this photo down here, if you can see it, if you're closer to the front, this is the exact same photo point. This is Elk Creek right off Petite Gap Road before and after that rain event. So to me, that picture, that highlights how dry we were. The other thing we were starting to do as that rain came in is what we call our bear program and so it's not a bear like a black bear it's burned area emergency response and so what bear allows us to do is say hey we had this big fire that came through this pretty large area did anything get damaged in a way that it's going to impact human life and safety property <coughs> natural resources things like that so while the fire was still going we put together this emergency response team and they came out, there were hydrologists, engineers, Megan Martin, our recreation trail specialist, and they, they, they look at all the impacts of the fire, they put together this fancy product where they use satellite imagery, and it's called a soil burn severity map. Joe, if you have questions, is gonna be the expert on the soil burn severity map and satellites. But here's the good news. When you go and you look at the soil burn severity, 
for the James River Face Wilderness during the Mass Creek Fire, almost the whole thing was low to very low severity. There's some pockets, the red, for those of you in the back, red of high severity. There's less than 1% of that whole 11,000 acres burned of high severity. And then moderate, less than 10% is at moderate. Um, so in the grand scheme of things, you don't have devastation, destruction out there. You have some pockets where some trees were killed, but for the most part, things are looking really, really good. I just hiked out there last week. Again, wait until spring, but things are looking really, really good out there. One thing we do have left for those of you who hike out there are a lot of hazard trees. So you'll start seeing these yellow warning signs pop up because we can't mitigate all the snags or the trees that will become snags or hazards in the next few years. This is my next to last slide. I think this is just a fire progression map. We'd be happy to talk about it, but different colors represent different days of fire growth. So in the early days when we only had one public information officer and we were putting out one public alert, and we were saying the fire doubled in size every day and people were panicking on us. It was all within the wilderness and we couldn't do a good job of telling the story, but this, this map kind of tells the story of the growth. You'll see the burnout day. There was a lot of growth at the end on that burnout. And then last, um, man, this was um, overall um, a really big success story for us. Things went well, and the things went well because of the relationships and the partners that we had. All of our partners, from folks at the Appalachian Trail Club to the Blue Ridge Parkway, Rockbridge County, I mean, uh, emergency management um, person and I were on the phone regularly. Um, we just had amazing support from all of our partners. These ladies represented um, Feed the Need organization, and they came in and they wanted to make sure that every firefighter that was away from their family had a beautiful Thanksgiving meal. And we had so much food left over, we were able to donate it to the community. Um, kids made school, uh, school kids made cards, came by and did visits. We just had so much community support and just so many relationships and help from partners that it was um, tremendously beneficial. Okay, this really is my next to last slide, sorry. Okay, so I'm just gonna end. In, when we talk about wildfire, there's something they tell us never to do. They say never talk about wildfire, which is not planned, at the same time you talk about prescribed fire or controlled burning. And I'm gonna make the fatal flaw of talking about both in one presentation, so bear with me. This is the time of year where you're gonna see smoke in the air from good fire. Just yesterday, we did a controlled burn over toward Bath County. We have controlled burns, prescribed burns, whichever you wanna call them, planned that you will see um, in the next month to two months. Several of them that you could potentially see from right here in Rockbridge. So I just want you all, in your spare time, if you just Google Virginia DWR and good fire, Virginia DWR and Good Fire, it pops up this webpage. It tells all about the reasons we do prescribe fire or controlled burning, and it even has a video where you can go out with people and watch them do a prescribed fire, which is pretty cool. But again, Virginia DWR, it's just another partner. It's the State Wildlife Resources Department, just another partner who happens to have a nicer website than us right now. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to end with that, and then all of us are going to be happy to entertain your questions until you want to have wine. Okay, I've done a lot of hiking up in this area since the fire. How did you keep the fire off of the trail? <laughs> okay, the, the question is, how did we keep the fire off of the trail? I'm assuming you've been out there since the fire. Yeah. Joe, do you want to talk about how... Fire, either one of you want to talk about how fire um, stops itself near trails? You talk about that. Um, typically, the trail system is this. Please your right. 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 Uh, Typically, the trail systems, because of the use, um, there's really no <coughs> amount of fuel that's left on them. And also, a lot of the trails out there, we did, we did try to use them in the suppression part of the fire. And so we did prep a lot of the trails. We blew a lot of the leaves out of the area, um, trying to slow the fire down. And that goes to your question of suppression strategy. We were trying to keep the box smaller and we had people in there. At a point we realized our efforts were 
um, I wouldn't say fruitless, but we didn't have a high probability of success. And we had a large number of firefighters in the middle of a very, a, a spot that would be very challenging to get them out of had they had a medical event or any other emergency. And we felt like the, the best strategy was to back off and provide a safer opportunity to fight the fire. We tried for several days and, and, and lost that. I'm gonna skip Mark Miller. <laughs> What, do you, what is your thought on what was the cause of this fire? So the cause of the fire is still under investigation. <laughs> Sorry for that, yeah. With uh, climate change and the conditions getting more susceptible to bigger wildfires, what, what planning is taking effect to kind of deal with that? So um, I'll, I'll hit a parts of that. Um, Air Resource Advisor being here was really helpful for the community. She spent some time during the fire and then she's offered to do follow-up for, that's probably not gonna be my kid's last smoke day, right? So there's some of those sorts of like community planning. We do a lot of planning with our partners on where, um, where are fires likely to happen where they're gonna be the most impactful, the wildland urban interface. So we're doing lots of, we're trying to target some of our prescribed burning in those areas, we're doing, um, in some places, mechanical fuel reduction projects to try to remove fuels from, from some of those tight places. The other thing that we as a forest are doing is we have um, increased our fire organization. Um, so we have more firefighters now, we have double, if not triple, the number of firefighters now that we had, for example, when I started here about 10 years ago. Um, Across the country, the answer to that question is, um, it varies a little bit. There are certain segments of the country that have been identified as wildlife crisis areas, and so they're doing even more things in those areas. We're just not in one of those. Mark, I'm sorry, I, I dodged you. You came in after I talked about wilderness too, so know that. So I was here two weeks ago talking about wilderness, and but I'm not here to ask Lauren a question. I'm just actually here to tell tell Lauren and her staff that they did an excellent job fighting that fight. Mm -hmm. It was just absolutely superb, so thank you. Thank you. So, in Lynchburg, where we live, okay. for the last uh, couple of days and into mid or late April, there's a fan burn. And so oh, yeah. you're out setting <coughs> fires. <laughs> Just discuss. I mean, yes, I will. That's a that's a fun one. That's a fun one. Uh, yeah. So the so the state of Virginia has a a fire season burn ban. You can't burn before four o'clock. So um, through a lot of conversations, the the Forest Service, Shenandoah National Park, other entities are not subject to that. Um, I wasn't going to show this because it's really wordy, but the reason we are not subject to that is because we typically have 100 sometimes page burn plans. We spend months of time um, and I can't remember how many years on here. You could get a graduate degree faster than you could become a person who's allowed to do this for us. Um, so we, we have lots of training and um, lots of training and lots of requirements and we have certain parameters and only if a, a day is checking every single one of those boxes are we allowed to do any sort of prescribed burning. It's also um, the state and others also recognize the value of us doing these burns and removing fuel on our terms and when we're planning it and we've got everything in, in place versus doing it in a wildfire situation. Anything else to add on the burn ban and the, the distinctions? Yeah, you're right. Um, the 4 p.m. law has been in effect for uh, several years. Uh, the real reason why it kind of came into effect was uh, the springtime, typically our, our H values, our relative humidity, really starts coming up after that 4 o'clock hour. So it's a little bit safer to light your fires after 4. And also a lot of our staff will volunteer at the time. And so, you know, you get off your job and you're available to help out after that. There's a lot of discussion going on with all of the fire folks here in Virginia about um, kind of tweaking that a little bit, because it, now it just is from one date to another date. Um, 
but now we're looking at possibly like if it rains a certain amount, you know, homeowners or landowners can burn on their own property. But that's got to go through a lot of channels, so it'll take a while, but it's out there. And most wildfires here are human caused, and so again, that's one way to try to prevent many of those wildfires from, from happening. Yes. Um, two things. Uh, number one, uh, was a sort of an epicenter or general area in which the fire originated? Has that been identified? Um, and secondly, can you describe for the, the ignorant person like myself the, uh, the use of the, the back burn? Yeah, so the fire was, how would you describe Maps Creek other than the middle of the wilderness near the near Maps Creek itself? Um, so we, we have a, a general origin, um, so we have identified that. One of you should tackle um, bringing fire down the line. Yeah, so um, the fire progression map shows it pretty well. It was definitely... Um, 15 minute hike up from Matt's Creek, somewhere in that area is where it started. Um, the back burning, uh, it, it's just us trying to take advantage and trying to manipulate fire to the best of our knowledge so that we don't like kill everything out there before it actually comes to our holding line. And so normally what we would do is if, if it's high up on the mountain, we just continue to let the fire back down because that's kind of the easiest way. You don't want to light it from the bottom and create like um, a lot of fire up in there because you tend to kill a lot of things. So that's the back burning strategy is we want all the fuels consumed uh, to the holding line itself. Fighting fire with fire. Um, if you go, if you're on social media and you go to the George Washington and Jefferson National Forest Facebook page, there's a couple videos where we describe it and though they were um, very helpful for a lot of people. So I'd encourage you to just take a look at those. You don't have to have a Facebook account or profile to look at those. But they had some videos and they did some things in the field that helped too. Uh, where is the best place to go to find what your plans are for this drive burn in case you were planning? Like, I have a this. website that I can show you right after this. There's um, there's a, a page that as a map with a viewer, I checked it two days ago. Um, and there are, last year everything showed up perfectly. This year some of our plan burns aren't showing up, so it's deceiving right now. But, and I have your contact information so I can share that with you as well. But, and I can pass that on if you would like to see that as well. What I was told is within the next two weeks all of our burns should be reflected. You can actually look at the burns for the whole southern region of the Forest Service on that if you'd like. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Lauren, when we've hiked the area that we're discussing here, Several things stand out, just how bright green the moss is along the trail and the blackened lumber that's down. But it appears, just to layman looking up, that a lot of the trees don't even look singed. No, what? Huge and down So Y'all should like come over here. I feel like the soil burn, uh, uh, soil map, it was severity oriented. You know, kind of tells the story uh, for the rest of the vegetation. It was a low severity, a low to moderate severity burn. So a lot of the vegetation, including the trees and the shrubberies, uh, it, low impact. And so I would fully expect in the spring things to be really vibrant. And that contrast between black and green is going to be really, really nice. Um, basically, you know, the fire effects that we saw that are present on the landscape is, is merely nutrient recycling of the leaves and the sticks and the small fuels that feed the plants that survive the fire. And so that, that whole balance between good fire, bad fire, um, and, and a lot of times we want to say good fire is prescribed because we we put a lot of energy into to finding the exact weather elements to create good fire. And it's amazing to me that that we have such low to, to moderate fire effects in a, such a, a large block in a very, very dry time. That, that, is, that is purely um, how the team that came in and all the firefighters that worked the fire, that's, that, that's a testament to how they handled 
the, the backfires, the helicopter operations. It was methodical, it was well thought out, and the reason why we have such low effects to everything out there is it's, 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 uh, it's intentional. We had plenty of opportunities to screw it up and we, we didn't see it well. <laughs> I mean, there were some folks that spent really late nights doing some firing operations late into the evening because they, they saw if they didn't take care of it, it could move faster than we wanted it to. So just awesome work by firefighters. Way in the back. Can you talk a little bit about the wildfire response? That is why I brought Danny, so I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> So, so fire is, a, you know, has been a part of our natural ecosystem forever. It's largely shaped what we have on the landscape, landscape now. So all, all the species associated with the, the habitat that we have have come along with fire. So um, larger animals like deer, turkey, bear that, that can run fast, fly, you know, they, they, they elude the fire itself. Um, smaller animals, I get a lot of questions about what about <coughs> turtles and salamanders and uh, herpifauna, animals that can't maybe move from the advancing fire. And sure, there's probably a few that, that don't make it. Um, the adage of you have, sometimes you have to crack an egg to make an omelet is, is absolutely true with habitat creation, with nutrient recycling with fire being a part of the natural ecosystem. A few of these species or a few individuals are probably not gonna make it. However, I'll give you an example of, of how species are adapted and have come along with fire. Terrestrial salamanders, most of them require some sort of moisture or water in their life cycle for breeding. They do not like hot and dry. When the surface of the Match Creek fire is hot and dry enough to sustain fire, those species will not be on the surface. They will be subsurface where there is moisture. And the drier it is, the deeper they will be. They don't know that there's a fire coming or that there could be one. But nature sets itself up and protects those species and, the, and they will be subsurface. Question over here on the right. Sir, fire detection. I'm old enough to remember there were fire towers and all, which I don't think there are anymore. How do you find fires efficiently? Again, it's a team sport. Um, we are typically not the first ones to find them. Um, many times it's a local area resident that notices smoke and they call 911 or they call, um, they call someone. Um, we, we share all that information very quickly. We have um, what's called the Virginia Interagency Coordination Center. And it's a, an entity where there's federal and state folks there. And if any sort of a call comes in about wildfire, all that information is shared with all of us. Um, so that's one way. Um, we typically have staff on when we're in, um, you know, these guys like to go home and enjoy time with their families. But when it's really dry, like in November, we were trying to rotate. So we had staffing on seven days a week. Um, and sometimes part of that staffing, they're just doing some driving around. Um, we had two or three other fires that happened and we had to respond to during the Mass Creek fire, for example. Um, and yeah, Joe in his second week was fighting like three fires at, at one time, so. Anything else on like, on fires getting called in? Cell phones. It, yeah, it, it's so much of the public now will call these I used to work at Shenandoah National Park, and it was, yeah, we got a lot of visitation, we had a lot of people calling. <clears throat> and they're very accurate with, you know, where it is, and lots of times in a wilderness area, this is probably like a hiker, you know, somebody that just saw this and they call it in quickly. So, one more? Yeah, as you stated, this is a very steep area, and having hiked after the fire, after a rain, all of the streams are much more swollen. There's a lot more runoff than I've noted in the past. And the question is, are, are we to expect more erosion as a result of the fire? Perfect question. Again, Danny didn't really want to come tonight. So <laughs> you're even more perfect than me. Take it away. Um, great question. And we, as the resource advisor, um, I was asking and other resource 
supervisors were asking that question before the fire was actually contained. So post-fire, we saw the rain event approaching, um, and we took advantage of that, and we set up a time-lapse camera in Max Creek, and we took a pre-water sample, water chemistry sample, in Max Creek to get a baseline. And, and the next storm that came through, I think, was a three-inch event. And the day after that event, we went back to Max Creek and we collected another water sample. And we've gone back three or four subsequent times and taken other water chemistry samples and, and given them to the folks here in town at Pace to analyze for a lot of the a lot of different matrix. Um, one that we're looking at really close is pH alterations. The time lapse camera really helps show the ebb and flow of the stream. And from what we're seeing, both on the ground and with the time lapse information, and with a glance at the water chemistry that we haven't completely processed and, and really analyzed thoroughly, is very little to no impact to these streams uh, whatsoever. And that light severity and moderate severity has a lot to do with it. The, the duff and the, the mat that covers the soil is still intact largely. And, and that really helps with erosion. So all points, uh, you know, all, all indications are that things are going to be really good in the ways of impacts of the stream, both from, you know, from erosion uh, and from ash. Uh, but we're going to continue to monitor that you know, over the next two or three more rain events, and then we'll put a, a report together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. So there's a lot I could say on our collective behalf about this presentation in the interest of time. Let me say that this is probably the most professional and engaging presentation I've ever been to. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.